Um, good afternoon, everybody. Please join me in welcoming John Stars, a public health officer with the Canadian Public Health Service at the Public Health Agency of Canada. She will be talking about the children's blood lead levels from a biomonitoring study in St. John's, Newfoundland and Labrador. So she's currently placed with the Environmental Health Services at the BC Center of Disease Control in Vancouver, BC. And she's a native of Newfoundland. She graduated from the University of Toronto with a Master's in Health Science degree in Epidemiology and Community Health in 2008. And prior to that, she was studying to become an epidemiologist. So um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Joanne. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to thank you all for attending my presentation today, either in person or online. So at the time Sarah Henderson asked me to speak uh, at this seminar series, she asked me to if I could also speak uh, to my work as a roaming epidemiologist. So I'll start by uh, discussing the program I work for at the, uh, the pro program I work for, the Canadian Public Health Service at FAC. Um, and this will also give it a bit of an idea as to how I became involved with the N lead NL research study and how I ended up in Vancouver, allowing me to speak to you at the UBC Occupational and Environmental Health Seminar, seminar Series today. I've also brought some CPHS promotional items, so please take some if you haven't already. So um, I'll start by briefly discussing um, the Public Health Agency of Canada and where CPHS fits into the, pro uh, into the organization. So um, the mission of the, of the Public Health Agency of Canada is to pr promote and protect the health of Canadians through leadership, partnership, innovation, and action in public health. Um, within the Public Health Agency of Canada sits the Office of Public Health Practice, uh, whose mission is to increase the effective, effectiveness of public health practice in Canada. Within that is the Field Services Training and Response Division, which houses the Canadian Public Health Service, as well as the Canadian Field Epidemiology Program. So this is a, 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 a visual representation of what the Field Service Training and Response Division looks like. Um, so as you can see, the CFAP and CPHS programs fit within that. Some of you, if, or some of you, if not most of you, may already be familiar with the CFAP program. It's been around since the mid-1970s. Um, the emphasis is on training field epidemiologists, building public health capacity uh, and emergency response. They have an annual intake of about five to 10 public health professionals, um, epidemiologists, uh, medical doctors, and veterinarians uh, to obtain specialized training and provide service. Placements are within local and provincial ter and territorial public health organizations uh, for mentorship and project opportunities. Um, and they respond to requests for epidemiologic assistance in Canada and internationally. So in comparison with the CPHS program, it, it was created in 2006. The emphasis is on addressing stakeholders' needs and building public health capacity in Canada. Um, they recruit, place, and train qualified permanent public health staff in locations across Canada to address identified federal as well as provincial, territorial, or local public health priorities and gaps. And we, res we, re we respond to routine as well as emerging public health events, including outbreaks. So I'll now move on to give a little bit more detail about um, CPHS. So the key drivers for the creation of the Canadian Public Health Service uh, came uh, from uh, Dr. Naylor's report in 2003, which was released after the SARS crisis. Um, the, um, the, 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 the two key recommendations that align specifically with the CPHS mandate is around human resource capacity in public health, um, as well as uh, epi surveillance and surge capacity. Um, this kind of shows how CPHS aids the Public Health Agency of, in, of Canada in meeting Dr. Naylor's recommendation. Um, and of course, surge capacity um, is for the agency overall, not just for the placement sites and their jurisdictions. Um, so uh, a surge capacity can be deployed for both domestic and international situations. The public health officer uh, is a permanent full-time federal employee um, with a variety of public health skills, including epidemiology, surveillance, data management, and health policy. Um, public health officers are placed across Canada so as to contribute to meeting public health needs, contribute to the federal response in case of pandemic or public health emergency events, 
we rotate around the country every two years. Well, most of us do. Um, we have a unique role among um, Public Health Agency of Canada field staff, which includes uh, we get support at the provincial and territorial and local levels um, in addressing health needs identified in our work plan. Um, and the Canadian Public Health Service further contributes to public health officer development uh, through acquiring transferable core competencies on the job and as, as well as experience um, to respond to public health needs across the country. Um, so one of the, the key things I'd like to mention to you here today, uh, being <laughs> presumably public health students, um, the CPHS also provides opportunities for graduate students to receive support and gain applied public health experience with, within their master's and PhD programs. Uh, the placements uh, address jurisdictional needs with a focus in Canada's north. Um, placements range from four months to a year. And CPHS in the past has provided five UBC students with practicum placements in the north. Um, as well, uh, the Field Services Training Response Division has been pretty highly involved in, in BC. Currently, uh, there's three public health officers within the province. Um, uh, myself, as well as an epidemiologist at Interior Health, and uh, an epidemiologist at the First Nations Health Council and the BC Centre for Disease Control. Um, there's currently four field epidemiologists in BC, all of whom are supervised by CFEP alumni. Um, and uh, interesting to point out, uh, the BC CDC and Vancouver Coastal Health have been placements for generations of field, epide uh, field epidemiologists in the past. Um, and key achievements of uh, field service training response field staff in BC um, uh, were, uh, were the, most importantly, um, the Fraser Health Population and Strategic Plan, uh, as a public health officer example. A public health officer at Fraser Health uh, was involved in activities related to placement site, the placement site strategic planning. Um, and we held the Field Services Training Institute in Vancouver in June 2011, which incidentally was the first time I'd ever been any further west than Ontario. <laughs> um, so, um, as a real example of the kind of work that a public health officer does. Um, prior to coming to Vancouver in uh, about seven months ago, I was placed for two years at the within the Communicable Disease Control Group at the Eastern Regional Health Authority uh, in Newfoundland and Labrador. Um, I worked under the supervision of the Regional Medical Officer of Health um, and worked with a number of different groups and, key and, and stakeholders within the province. Um, some of my projects pertained to um, well, I guess it would be better to say that while I was nested with the CDC team at Eastern Health, I was more of a jack-of-all-trades epidemiologist. Um, I've included a list of some of the larger projects that I was involved in during my time there. Um, so population health is one of the four strategic directions outlined in Eastern Health Strategic Plan for 2011 and 2014. The health status report that I worked on there uh, contributed to the, or contributes to the population health approach by providing population level health information and interpretations. Um, and it was launched at the same time as Eastern Health's chronic disease prevention and management strategy. Um, Outbreak Summaries is an online tool developed by the Canadian Network for Public Health Intelligence. And I served as a provincial lead uh, during the implementation of that program, or that uh, tool in Newfoundland and Labrador. Prior to implementing this system, outbreaks and clusters of disease were reported on paper forms. Outbreak Summaries allows for the analysis of data, uh, real-time notifications of posting to the a posting to the site if, for those who need to be aware, and linkage with Public Health Alerts, which is another SIMFI application that serves as a communication tool within a particular jurisdiction within the country or across the country. So it's my in involvement in the LED ML uh, project ultimately that led me to pursue a placement in, in environmental health, and is the project that I will be discussing in more detail with you today. My current placement uh, with environmental health services at the BCCDC is certainly providing me with excellent uh, networking, learning, and training opportunities. Uh, and ultimately, through my work, I'm developing a skill set which can be transferred to my next placement site, wherever that may be. <laughs> I was also involved in uh, communicable disease investigations while at Eastern Health, um, such as investigations of hepatitis B in a long-term care setting and community-acquired MRSA. During one of the investigations I was involved in, I had the pleasure of working very closely with a public health officer student who was studying for her an NPH at U of T at the time. So if any of you are interested in more information, um, my manager and, and current regional coordinator have kindly offered their contact information should any of you like to you know, 
uh, want any questions or have any questions you'd like to have answered. Um, so, on to the meat of my presentation. Um, I should, uh, should say that uh, multiple organizations were involved in the, the Red NL project, um, such as Memorial University, uh, Eastern Health, and uh, Health Canada. <clears throat> so I'm, I'm going to give a general background of the uh, situation uh, and the, the research project. I'll go through the study objectives and research questions, the methods, results, um, conclusions, and questions at the end. So um, there was a lot of really great people who brought this project uh, into being and, and saw it through. Um, and I would feel pretty terrible if I didn't uh, give credit where credit is due. So um, Dr. Trevor Bell was uh, involved. Uh, he's a professor at the Department of Geography at Memorial University. Dr. David Allison, who is the Medical Officer of Health at the Eastern Regional Health Authority. Uh, Jacinth David from Health Canada, uh, as well as Ka Kathleen Perwick, who is the Project Manager, Sarah Mackey, um, Felicia Picard, and Rob Foley, who both were master students at the time. And that included here is Mark Kuraja, who is a former public health officer at Eastern Health prior to my arrival there, um, who went on to become a medical student at MUN. Uh, he was involved in initial phases, such as proposals, um, as well as taking the lead on developing the database used for the study. Um, and at the time I became involved in this project, it was, it was underway. Recruitment and consent had just begun. Um, I was able to be involved in this project from attaining consent, leading sampling teams, delivering questionnaires, uh, aiding with the da database construction, data entry, cleaning and validation, database management, analysis and reporting, as well as mentoring Masters of Science students in their analysis. We also had a lot of help from a large number of students from Memorial, um, as well as communication support from Memorial University. So St. John's it's, eastern, it's on the easternmost edge of the island and the country. Um, it's situated on the northeast Avalon Peninsula. In 2003, it was found that lead levels in the downtown regions exceeded 10 times the Canadian Council's, uh, Council of Ministers of the Environment guidelines. Um, lead was presented as an issue of concern in the media based on the, the, this work, um, uh, looking at environmental lead concentrations in the city. Um, so over 50% of soil samples um, were found to exceed the uh, CCME residential soil guideline of 140 parts per million. 100% um, of these samples were taking, taken on pre-19 uh, properties built uh, properties built before 1926. Um, average lead cons uh, average lead levels were higher than in other Canadian cities, and similar to some Canadian c communities affected by industrial sources of lead. Despite St. John's not being a heavily industrialized city. So median uh, lead levels, for example, were higher than in communities such as Sudbury, Ontario, uh, Ottawa, Cowlitz, Port Holborn, Ontario. Um, and of course, median levels were lower than in Trail and uh, Sydney, Nova Scotia. Um, compared to much larger cities in the United States, uh, the median soil, median soil lead value for St. John's is similar to any inner, uh, inner city open areas of New Orleans. So, where did the lead come from? Um, St. John's is, uh, has been well, the oldest, oldest English-founded city in North America. Um, it had year-round inhabitants of European ancestry um, within the first few decades of the 17th century. Um, as I just mentioned, uh, Newfoundland is, or, sorry, St. John's is not a heavily industrialized city. Lead deposition in the environment uh, largely, is largely historical and uh, related to widespread use of uh, coal for heating and uh, industry. Um, a historical use of brightly colored paint on external surfaces of homes and other buildings, uh, which weathers and ships over time. Um, this, of course, this trend has persisted into the present day, though lead content in paint has decreased uh, in more recent, uh, recent times. As, and of course, uh, the use of leaded gasoline um, uh, helped uh, spread the lead around, and as well, there was a small number of devastating fires in the 19th century, which destroyed large portions of the city at the time, and destroyed really what's uh, much of what's the present-day downtown core. So, thereby further dispersing the lead into the environment. So, the objective of this study was to determine if there is an increased exposure for children uh, to re residential residential lead in older housing stock in St. John's. 
Um, and the questions we sought to answer were, is there a relationship between residential lead exposure as measured by children's blood lead levels and housing age? Do children between 6 and 36 months have a higher lead exposure than children aged 37 to 72 months, so 3 to 6 years? Are there any additional factors that influence lead exposure among children living in older uh, residential properties in St. John's? And while this was um, a, a much larger, larger study in terms of uh, what we collected, uh, environmental samples on water, uh, soil, household dust, produce, paint chips, um, and there's some work done around bioaccessibility, these data and results are presented elsewhere. I'm just going to be speaking to the blood lead and questionnaire portion. So uh, for recruitment, uh, we used a two-stage cluster sampling strategy um, and uh, neighborhood canvassing. So neighborhoods with older housing stock and uh, more young children at, at the time of the, I guess it was the 2006 census, um, those were the neighborhoods that we had targeted um, and, uh, uh, for, to, to find um, participants. And um, the housing age categories that we used, um, well, the year of construction, uh, the first, uh, the first uh, cohort would have been uh, uh, houses with a year of construction before 1946, 1946 to 1960, 1961 to 1970, 1971 to 1980, 1981 to 2000, and 2001 to 2010. Uh, and these housing age, housing age uh, categories were based on, in, uh, on neighborhood level information. Um, from Statistics Canada, which is available through a really interesting tool, um, uh, the Newfoundland and Labrador Community Accounts. In terms of inclusion uh, criteria, um, to be included in the study, uh, households had to have at least one child between the ages of six months and six years. The consenting adult had to have the right to speak on behalf of the child and the household. The child had to be available for blood sampling and the guardian for questionnaire delivery. Um, the household couldn't live in an apartment, and the age of the house had to be confirmed using official sources. The data were collected um, um, in, in, in three parts. So the first step was to get a, get a blood sample. Uh, blood was collected by a phlebotomist at the Janeway Children's Health and Rehabilitation Center in St. John's. Um, and then at the time of environmental sampling, we delivered a questionnaire face-to-face uh, -face with the parent or guardian. Um, and it, uh, it included about 50 questions, um, some of which pertained to assessing uh, the behavior and risks for lead exposure. Um, and as I mentioned uh, just a little while ago, there was a lot of environmental data collected as well. So soil, tap water, household dust, paint chips, and produce samples were also collected. But as I said, these are presented out elsewhere. If anyone's interested, I can certainly uh, put you in touch with people who would be able to provide that information. So for the analyses, um, I, uh, we used an ANOVA. Um, and we had to have um, two, uh, two, uh, two um, separate streams, I guess, for analysis. We used a, a mixed effects model um, for some of the data as a smaller number of children were from the same household. Um, we included household as a random variable for analyzing information specific to the child. And we used a fixed effects ANOVA um, for household level information. Um, and uh, in the cases, in the situations where uh, multiple children came from one household, we averaged the blood uh, lead levels for that. And um, then model selection was conducted by backwards elimination using a selection level of alpha equals one, uh, 0.10. The study was funded by Health Canada. And we had obtained ethics approval from Health Canada's Research Ethics Board and Memorial University's Human Investigations Committee. So um, canvassing activities um, covered 75 of 95 census neighborhoods in St. John's. Um, we had 257 children from 200 households provide blood samples. And uh, for 249 of those children from 194 households, um, we had questionnaire and environmental data as well. Um, when we looked back, um, after we had collected all the data uh, and new census information became available, um, we realized we oversampled children from houses built in 1970 or earlier, so those children we perceived at being at highest risk. 
uh, um, uh, and we undersampled children from houses built in 1971 or after. Um, and those were the children that we perceived to be at lowest risk. Um, and of course, we were looking through doing this study. We were looking at testing relationships and not describing blood lead levels among ch children in the city. So uh, this this uh, figure uh, shows uh, the distribution of blood lead in uh, the uh, 257 children for whom we'd obtained blood samples. Um, it's it's uh, blood lead levels were far lower than we had anticipated seeing, which is a very good news story. Um, the median blood lead level was 1.04 micrograms per deciliter, and the geometric mean was 1.12 micrograms per deciliter, with a 95th percentile of 2.71 micrograms per deciliter. Um, only one child uh, was found to have a blood lead level above uh, the current American guideline, um, 5 micrograms per deciliter. And no child was found to have a, a blood lead level above 10 micrograms per deciliter, which is the current Canadian guideline. Housing age was found to be associated with children's blood lead levels. Geometric mean blood lead levels were highest in children from houses built before 1946 and lowest in homes built between 1946 and 1960, interestingly. Overall, uh, geometric mean blood lead levels ranged from 0.887 micrograms per deciliter to 1.35 micrograms per deciliter. Um, overall, the geometric mean blood lead level was uh, 1.12 micrograms per deciliter, so it was pretty low. As for child's age, um, we had a, well, uh, we had 105 children, uh, so 42% of our, our sample um, were between the ages of six months and three years. 144 children, or 58%, were between the ages of three and six years. And geometric mean blood lead level was found to be highest among children below the age of three years. So nothing surprising there. The geometric mean blood lead level was uh, 1.29 for children aged six months to, th to three years, and uh, one uh, p uh, microgram per deciliter for children aged three to six years. And this is a statistically significant difference in geometric mean blood lead levels. Um, so in terms of the questionnaire, the final model included um, uh, uh, the, f the final fixed effects model, uh, so household level information, included uh, housing age, child's age, um, whether or not uh, a child uh, was from a household where an adult had a hobby that involved exposure to lead, um, and ingestion of paint chips. While that wasn't, a, wasn't significant, it was kept in the model. Um, and um, of course, this question pertained to observed ingestion of paint chips and dirt. <laughs> Not everyone's going to, to witness that. Um, and household was significant. So when I went back and did an ad hoc analysis, um, we found that uh, a higher geometric mean blood blood level was found in children from pre-1946 homes in comparison with children from homes built in 2001 to 2010. Uh, regarding child's age, there was a higher geometric mean blood lead level in children between the ages of six months and three years. Um, and children from homes where household adults did not have a hobby that involved exposure to, to lead had lower geometric, blood, uh, uh, geometric mean blood lead levels. In regards to the fixed effects ANOVA, so the household level, level information, once again, housing age was included in that. Um, uh, and that was found to be significant. Uh, yard soil was, uh, was something we found uh, to be significant as well. Um, and installation of new plumbing fixtures, as well as length, the length of time that tap waters typically run prior to use, they were left in the model as well. Um, when I went back and did an ad hoc analysis, uh, children from uh, pre-1946 homes had higher uh, geometric mean blood lead levels um, in comparison with children from homes built in 2001 to 2010. And interestingly, with the yard soil piece, um, a response of don't know to, the question, to a question determining whether or not new soil had been brought into the yard was associated with a significantly higher geometric mean blood lead level. And I'll get into that in a little bit. So in regards to conclusions from this study, 
no child um, had a blood lead level that exceeded the Canadian guideline of uh, 10 micrograms per deciliter. Only one child exceeded the US CDC's blood lead re uh, level, uh, reference level of 5 micrograms per deciliter. Blood lead levels were lower than we had anticipated, despite oversampling children perceived to be at higher risk. Um, and in terms of some limitations, um, the sampling methods um, results in an atypical population. So we aren't able to generalize our conclusions really to uh, other populations. And we did not include information on psychosocial factors, um, so such as socioeconomic status. So we don't know how these impacted our results. So. Young children are more vulnerable to lead exposure for a variety of reasons, including crawling and pica. Um, we found that geometric mean blood blood levels were highest among uh, younger children between the ages of six months and three years. Um, children from homes where household adults did not have a hobby that ex involved exposure to lead had lower geometric mean blood blood levels. Uh, so materials uh, containing lead that are used in hobby activities may be an additional source of lead within the home or property. Children from pre-1946 housing had higher geometric mean blood lead levels overall. Older residences may have materials that predate current guidelines for lead content. And regarding the response of don't know to a question about uh, whether or not new, uh, the, 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 the parent and guardian knew about uh, whether or not new soil had been brought into the yard um, being associated with significantly higher geometric mean blood lead levels, Current homeowners may not be aware of potentially complex history of landscaping on older residences. So environmental lead is a hazard. However, uh, lead exposure in St. John's affects only a small number of children. Um, as I mentioned, um, only one child had a blood lead level above 5 micrograms per deciliter and none above 10 micrograms per deciliter. Um, public health practitioners should re remain aware of risk factors such as housing age, child age, choice of hobbies, and lead content of yard soil um, in order to maintain a low probability of exposure among children in the city and be able to respond effectively in situations where a child has been found to have an elevated blood lead concentration. And by effective response, I'm, I'm more referring to guidance about how to limit exposure, so prevention of tracking soil from the property into the home. Um, and if you have any questions, I would be really happy to take them. We'll now take questions from the audience. Uh, thanks, Joanne. Um, I was wondering if you could just give us a, a bit more detail about um, the hobbies that involved lead exposure. And then I was also wondering, are, are there efforts being made to, I guess, make create public awareness about certain hobbies that might be causing people to drag lead back into the home? Certainly. Um, some of the big ones that we focused on were, uh, for example, stained glass, uh, ceramics. Some of the glazes includes, uh, includes lead uh, and different things like that, um, as well as uh, some hunting and people who do fly fishing. Uh, that sometimes like the, the weights will include lead. So those are the kind of hobbies that we were referring to. Um, and in terms, actually, it's, I'm really glad that you mentioned um, about outreach efforts and that sort of thing, because doing this kind of work in St. John's, it being a smaller community, we had a really great opportunity to include um, community partners um, from, uh, say, for example, the Safer Soils uh, group, which is a kind of a grassroots group that uh, kind of is concerned about those sorts of things in the city. As well, we had people from the province, uh, from Newfoundland and Labrador Housing, and and um, all over the place. So we, we actually had everyone come into the, uh, come into planning and as well as debriefing. And uh, some of that information has been used to to carry their efforts forward um, as well. Um, I know there was some outreach done by the Lead NL team after the fact. So. So I, thank you. Um, I found it interesting that you showed a couple news articles at the start. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of these types of exposures, there's often community outcry. Um, just wondering what you did to kind of communicate 
the results of this project with the community afterwards and if there was still outrage or if you managed to um, overcome those. Oh, okay. Actually, it being a good news story, um, the media wasn't particularly <laughs> interested. <laughs> but uh, a lot of effort was done in communicating the information. So we, um, there was a, we had a, a, a night where the lead investigators for the research team presented the results back to the participants. And then a couple nights after, they had it one big community uh, session um, to present the results back. There were some media releases. And um, um, as well, we had some reports that were sent around. And of course, all of the results from each participant was mailed back to, their, to them after, uh, at once we had the results in and we, were, we had verified and cleaned them. Um, but yeah, in terms of outrage, there was, there was very little. It was very quiet. <laughs> Thanks very much, Joanne. Um, in terms of what's currently happening at the BCCDC with respect to lead and blood lead, uh, there is an effort to try to make high concentrations of blood lead reportable the same way that you know other infectious diseases are reportable to the public health care system so that public health can become involved and follow up and provide guidance. Um, so you had that one concentration that wasn't quite over Canadian guidelines, but was still quite high in the <laughs> scheme of things. What uh, did you follow up with that case, and did you find out anything interesting? Ah, uh, right. Um, yeah, because there is no safe level of lead. Um, so with those, we had um, a, uh, a, a, a specific to our study, we had our own threshold of concern of about four micrograms per deciliter. So there was about three children above that. Those children um, were contacted and given advice about how to mitigate exposure um, and provided some information, and particularly the child that had the level above five, five micrograms per deciliter. Um, and uh, of course, when we had started the study, um, if we had found any child with a blood lead level above 10 micrograms per deciliter, at the time we got consent we um, got uh, the participant or the parent guardian's um, uh, 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 preference for whether or not they would we would forward the information on to a pediatrician at the Janeway Health and Rehabilitation Center in St. John's or to their family doctor. So, so we were prepared, but thankfully we didn't have to to do that sort of thing. Um, and as for specifics to that particular case, um, in the interest of of confidentiality. Probably we shouldn't go into that. <laughs> yeah, indeed, it is a good news story for the children of uh, and their parents of Newfoundland and Labrador. But are there any ongoing efforts by PHAC, FLAC, to look at other regions of Canada? And also, my second question is, what about older children? You, your study ended with children six years of age, I recall. How about the still the vulnerable population of uh, slightly older children. Okay, for sure. Um, so, you, you, in, okay. So, in terms of older children, there's been a lot of work uh, done at a national level. Say, for example, through the Canadian Health Measures Survey, um, and um, so there's a bit more information in Canada about older children, um, children under the age of six. Um, I think the most recent module might be looking at younger children. I'm not sure, but um, but uh, at the time that the study went ahead, there was there was no information for younger children um, at a national level, um, research specific. Um, so when it comes to children, um, uh, so children that are young, young children are particularly at higher risk for lead exposure to lead, the health and the health effects thereof. Um, because their bodies are still growing, their neurological their, their, uh, nervous system is still developing, um, and they are more inclined to take, uh, they, they have higher absorption rates uh, through digestion and things like that. So there's a bit more of a, a focus and a push on, on younger children, and particularly because they are higher risk. Um, does that answer your second question? Is that kind of getting, I'm not sure if I've been talking around it. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, and then for uh, re uh, national activities, um, as I mentioned, the Canadian Health Measure Survey is looking at uh, blood lead concentrations uh, in children and adults across the country. 
Um, I know at the time that that's, that was done, there was they didn't include uh, information from Newfoundland. Or, well, they didn't sample in Newfoundland, I should say. Um, in terms of what the Public Health Agency of Canada is doing, I'm not aware. Um, but I know Health Canada is very involved in, in that particular component. Um, they're the ones, I think, largely involved in things like the Canadian Health Measures Survey. I know they just recently completed a final draft of the, of the State of Science on lead. Um, and and uh, uh, that's all online. So it really compiles a lot of the information available. Um, and certainly, that was something that we fed our data into as well. Um, and then in, in BC, there's some work being done uh, around uh, lead and reporting of lead, as, as Sarah just mentioned, and potentially doing surveillance. So I have a question as well. Um, because of historic exposures from like leaded gasoline and paints, is there a, a possibility that there's like a background level that people have or children have? Or children always born with like zero micrograms and then they do the playing and all the pick and then it kind of builds up? Or is there like a, a, a lead background that children are supposed to have? And was if it, it's there, was it corrected for in your study? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, um, in terms of background level, I think that would be really, really specific to the environment that a, chi like a child would come through. I don't think that there's any natural background level of lead. I know there's no safe level for lead in the body um, and, uh, and that sort of thing. Um, um, yeah, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> so that's something we did not look at in the study. But I know there was a lot of work done around uh, in earlier research uh, from the Department of Geography, looking at uh, levels of lead in the environment that were due to historical de deposition. So through the sources that I mentioned, and natural background levels of lead in the environment. Uh, to follow up on that. There's certainly concern about prenatal exposure to lead and the amount of lead that the mother is exposed to. Uh, the BCCDC is undertaking a study on uh, exposure in pregnant women, pregnant immigrant women, as they tend to have different sorts of, of uh, sources of exposure and you know different makeups and what have you. They can actually lead to quite high blood lead concentrations, um, and there has been sort of the insinuation that that women should be tested for blood lead before they consider getting pregnant. Uh, and that if their blood lead is high, they should work to bring that down before they go ahead with a pregnancy. So that is, that's definitely a source of exposure, and it's not all that clearly understood at this point. Any other questions? I was wondering. Uh, when you were doing the ANOVA, you separated by the housing, the year of construction, and same for the age of the child. I was wondering how come it's separated at that specific cutoff point? Because for a year, it's not entirely just 10 year intervals the whole way through. Mm -hmm. so. Right, so, so why, why I looked at the, um, the, the, um, Oh. Oh, right. Sorry, sorry. I'm just heard. Um, yeah. So, in terms of housing construction, uh, the date of housing construction, we used those um, uh, age cohorts uh, for the housing uh, based on information that was available uh, through the uh, Newfoundland and Labrador community accounts. So, it's a um, it's a tool that kind of breaks down all, all the census information. Um, uh, at a neighborhood level. So that's why we did that. So we could look back and kind of, c if we wanted to do some comparisons, uh, we could, we didn't have to worry about that. Oh, I'm not sure why they did it that way. I wouldn't be able to answer it, but I can certainly look at, I can put you in, in contact with the, the groups that <laughs> do that and we can find that information. Um, and then for the age of the child, um, that work was done before I started um, with this project, so I wouldn't be able to answer it specifically. Um, but um, I th most of it had to do with certainly we had we didn't go from z age zero to one. We went we wanted six months to six years, so the age intervals weren't quite uh, equal because of that. So 
Um, and of course, that was a situation where we collected data. We didn't collect the specific age of the child. We collected it as a grouped thing. So it kind of was a bit of a limitation. Okay. Um, if that's all for questions, we'd, uh, please join me in thanking Joanne and her presentation. Thanks.